Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to St. Michael and All Angels Episcopal Church. We are very excited that you are here, and we are most excited that we are here to welcome the Archbishop of Canterbury and the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. It is a privilege to have both of these leaders here, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. To open us up, I'd like to invite the Bishop of Dallas, George Sumner, to come forward and open us in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Bless Justin and Michael in their ministries on behalf of that covenant. Strengthen the Anglican Center as a sign of that fellowship and open our hearts to hear your voice to us this afternoon, all through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. I, um, I want to uh, call forward, invite forward uh, Kurt Dunkel. He is the, uh, I just want to say that God loves all of us, but he particularly loves deans of Anglican Episcopal Seminaries. <laughs> Of all the folks, there's a special row in heaven. In addition to being a dean, he is also a chair, chair of the board of the uh, uh, Anglican Center in Rome, and I want to hand the mic to him. Thank you, Bishop Dean. I appreciate that very much. You're, uh... <laughs> I'm Kurt Dunkel, and I am the chairman of the board of the Anglican Center, uh, for the American Friends of the Anglican Center, and one of the two American governors on the board of trustees for the Anglican Center. It is a place for you. Um, the Anglican Center in Rome was founded 52 years ago as a consequence of the success of Vatican II, where you may remember the Roman Catholic Church decided we weren't so bad. That's a, that's a high <laughs> theological statement, okay? So um, I would be more specific, but you're not my class. So we weren't so bad, and they would like to get to know us. And so the Anglican Center has three goals. Number one, it is the place where the official representative, call him the ambassador, from the See of Canterbury interacts with the Vatican. So uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's personal representative is uh, uh, Archbishop Natui, who is the current director of the center, and that is his job. The second thing is for education. We put on about a dozen or so, anywhere between six and a dozen short courses for which you are invited to come. Uh, in the American Friends, we have come up with a tagline, which is, you cannot fall in love unless you first hold hands. So, come, right? Is this not right? This, these are high theological thoughts, remember. <laughs> so, if you don't come to Rome, you can't fall in love with the center. So, you can send us $1,000 if you want, and we would appreciate it. But what we really want you to do is come to Rome. Come to Rome. So, the second thing is, are these short courses. The third thing is really the most wonderful part, and is simply hospitality. It is a place, and a truly gorgeous place, where Roman Catholics and Anglicans of all stripes can come together, can love each other, and can leave feeling loved by one another and by Jesus himself. Please come visit us at the Anglican Center in Rome. And now I have the great pleasure to introduce two true leaders uh, in ecumenism. Ecumenism uh, is one of those seminary words, and I guess since I'm a dean of a seminary, I can throw out things like that. But what it really means, if you want to know what ecumenism means, turn to chapter 17 of John's Gospel. It is where the punchline to that long discourse that Jesus gives, he says, so that we all may be one. That's it. The punchline of ecumenism is John 17, so we all may be one. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, our special guest here today, um, was, uh, is, is the patron of the Anglican Center. He has three foci of his ministry, uh, prayer and the religious life, increase of the religious life, um, reconciliation, um, and um, goodness, <laughs> and evangelism and witness. <laughs> These are embodied within the, Ang the Anglican Center of Rome. Our own presiding bishop was elected three years ago at General Convention. 
2015, and a year or two ago when I was with him, I said, uh, Presiding Bishop, what is it that you would say is the focus of your ministry? And he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, Kurt, it's Jesus. <laughs> So with no further ado, I am so pleased to welcome and to thank uh, the rector of uh, St. Michael and All Angels, Chris Agirata, to Tony Bruggle. Tony, where are you? Tony is the man for truly all seasons, puts all this together as vice chairman of our board, and to all of you volunteers uh, who have worked so heartily for this and for those of you, for you coming. And now we would uh, love for you to welcome uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, and our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, to talk about love and reconciliation in the context of that love and reconciliation that goes on for 52 years in Rome and Canterbury through the Anglican Center of Rome. Please join me in welcoming him. On behalf of everyone here today, it's a great pleasure to welcome you both to Dallas, to St. Michael and All Angels, in order to talk about love and reconciliation and the work that is being done around the world. And so to kick us off, I would love for you to speak about the unity that the Anglican Center in Rome works for. You know, our world is so divided, as we know. Unity is one of those high callings that the church can witness to in the world. And I'd love for you all to tell how you are doing that, particularly in your work with other churches like at the Anglican Center. I think um, the history, particularly of the Protestant churches since the Reformation, is such that expectations of church unity are so unbelievably low that it is very easy to surprise people positively. We may look on that as a mild advantage in an otherwise rather gray environment. And in 1966, uh, Michael Ramsey went uh, to visit the Pope. It was the first official visit since the Reformation. There'd been an unofficial visit. I do both official and unofficial visits. They feel much the same to me, but apparently they are <laughs> completely different. Do you do, you do this? Uh, no, we really don't. You just show up. You just show up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you did that in Windsor. <laughs> show up. Couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> Sorry, I mustn't get carried away, but it, golly, golly, golly. Oh, that was a memory. Um, I've got some, no, I must resist the urge to tell those stories. Um, but the Anglican Center in Rome, um, Ramsey and, and Pope Paul VI met and it is extraordinary that nobody, Fisher had met unofficially in the 50s, met um, uh, Pope John XXIII, uh, much against the will of all his senior advisors, John XXIII being a bit like Francis. And uh, we don't have archbishops or anyone like that nowadays, of course, who ignore their advisors. Oh, no. No. <laughs> We always do what our advisors say. Of course. Always. Um, <laughs> we do. <laughs> I'm going you know, to make your life as hard as possible. <laughs> and um, we then, and it just, it was an extraordinary moment because what the Pope did was he took off his Episcopal ring and gave it to Michael Ramsey. And of course, that is the sign of a bishop, or one of the signs of a bishop. And that was, Rome works very much on symbol. So to have a symbol of our presence in Rome is incredibly important. It's much more important 
than even the day-to-day -day contact because it actually says we are part of this, we are here, we have links, we have friends. It has huge practical impact. Um, Archbishop Bernard now and Archbishop David Moxon, his predecessor and their predecessors before them, uh, are very much in the Vatican as my representative to the Vatican. But more importantly than that is the uh, traffic of pilgrims from the Anglican Communion visiting Rome and seeing both the strengths and the weaknesses, but seeing, having this sense of we belong to something that is far, far bigger even than the Anglican Communion, and that is big. But this is far, far bigger, that we are part of the great work of God through the centuries, uh, which has led to the greatest outflowings of culture and music and art and beauty, and also some of the greatest crimes and failures of our vocation. And we see, and through the Anglican Center, you can reflect on this, it helps us understand our own churches better. Um, and as we understand ourselves better and others better, reconciliation begins to emerge. We begin to feel that we belong more to each other. So it's, it's an incredible place. You're not gonna say anything. No, no, I'm a sidekick. My job is to kind of... Just... <laughs> <laughs> now that... <laughs> is going to provoke a story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. uh, you need to understand that American time and British time are very different. <laughs> because <laughs> Bishop Michael, he, he, I mean, seriously, not joking about it, his sermon at that wedding was one of the greatest sermons, the most impactful sermons that the United Kingdom has heard in living memory. <laughs> I mean, there's the following Tuesday on our main morning chat show on the radio. It's more than a chat show. They'd be terribly offended. Um, it's, it's a very serious news show. And the very seriously atheist presenter on the day uh, was interviewing a clergy person from the, uh, works in his speaker to the House of Commons and a uh, uh, Caribbean uh, British activist from South London. Uh, so this was the Tuesday after the wedding, and they said, and played 20 seconds of your sermon to start the interview, and then said, I don't need to tell anyone what that is. It is the sermon. <laughs> now, you know, that's just mind-boggling. And he didn't need to tell you. But, but the difference in time is striking, because Bishop Michael was told very firmly by no less than the Archbishop of Canterbury on behalf of the Queen, that he was to preach for seven minutes, <laughs> at the most. I had no idea that there are two British minutes to every American minute. <laughs> so he was actually slightly under time. Because he wasn't 14, he was 13 minutes and 10 seconds. <laughs> Not that I was counting. <laughs> Sorry, do carry on. Do you have other well, points to make? You have more questions for us? <laughs> well, so since you brought up the wedding, I think we were all so pleased at the world's reaction to the hope and the love that you gave witness to yes. in that sermon. On the one hand, excited. <coughs> on the other hand, I think we see the opportunity the hunger that is out there, that people really want this message of Christ. And I'm wondering, since that moment, what have you experienced that has perhaps added to or shifted your own ministry? Well, you know, in all honesty, I mean, one of the things that, that Archbishop Justin said to me, I don't know if you remember this, but, but early on, it may have been before we were on the way to Windsor, he said, I think you said, don't hold back. <laughs> but, but then he said, 
We want to see Jesus. And I think that is what we have to commend to our culture um, and to our world, um, is this Jesus of Nazareth and what he has taught us about living and what he has shown us mm -hmm. and the vibrancy of his living reality as the risen Lord. I really do, I think that's what we have to commend. Um, and the world responds. Yeah. I don't think Michael Curry did, I don't think I said anything new. Mm. It was the old, old story. It was. It yeah. was the gospel. It was what you said to do, show us Jesus. And I think that reaction was to Jesus. Mm. To see for if just a fleeting moment the power of his love and what it, what it actually can and could do in our lives and in, the, in this world. Um, you know, it was just for a fleeting moment, you know, and it's kind of like the Camelot at the end of, let me all remember Camelot. Um, uh, for one brief shining moment, there was a spot called Camelot. And it was like for, for a moment, you kind of saw love breaking down barriers. I mean, you look at the couple and say, I mean, they were like really in love. I mean, it's like, you could tell that. But, but for moments, people's political differences were overcome. Mm. I mean, it, people's uh, two nations, I mean, Britain and America. Um, I mean, you know, the, the Atlantic Ocean wasn't between us, um, but people around the globe. I mean, I've run into people who are not religious at all on the street, you know, after we take the selfies. Um, <laughs> I want to, every time I take a selfie, I want to thank you. <laughs> I tell you, charge a dollar a shot, you, you'll, we get, <laughs> you'll retire early. <laughs> it's amazing. But I have had more conversations about faith and spirituality about Jesus. and about Jesus. And they're not afraid to ask. I have literally, literally had more of that. And I've talked to clergy who have had more of that kind of interaction. Um, that, that's been the real result. And so I'm just pray that the Spirit of God will use that. Um, you know, I really did, and I was, I wanted Michael to get out of the way. Mm. This was God's moment. Mm. Like, like the old folks say, Michael, get out of the way and let God have his way. And, and that's what I was praying for. Um, plus, I just didn't want to do something like scratch my nose or something and, <laughs> <laughs> and embarrass the whole Episcopal Church. <laughs> I think. I think too, I mean, this is, the thing that fascinates me though as well is that you have those glorious, extraordinary moments of revelation of who Jesus is, of who Jesus is in love for the world, in love amongst people, the power of love in your phrase. And then of course people go home. They get up to work the next morning and they have to live that out in the midst of normal life. Part of, one of the things I'm more and more struck by and when I travel around is seeing, is watching churches live things out in normal daily life. Because the issues of reconciliation and of love are issues that aren't only you know, about nations, stopping fighting or civil wars ending or uh, racial reconciliation, or <coughs> ethnic reconciliation or religious reconciliation. It is actually making it work day to day. And it, it's in the daily grind that the love of Christ is seen most clearly by our neighbors and becomes something that draws them into that love. And, you know, bringing it back to the Anglican Center in Rome, that is that lives out the daily grind and pressure of difference between our two communities. We have um, this wonderful community at Lambeth, um, which started a few years ago, called the Community of St. Anselm of Young People. And uh, they, they live with us for 10 months, and it's pretty tough. It's, it's pretty arduous. Uh, I won't take all your time talking about it now. But one of the things that's striking with that is that they have to learn, coming from totally different backgrounds, to live together as they should day to day. So you've got people from Pakistan, men from Pakistan, women from 
New York. And the cultural assumptions are not the same. I think I could safely say that. And we, now the Anglican Center is dealing both with the great issues of when we prepare for meetings and between the Archbishop and whoever's the Pope at the time or the Archbishop at the time. But it's also dealing with the daily grind of reconciliation and there you learned about the daily grind of reconciliation and the outpouring of love that brings the churches together. That's why I think having places like that is, is so important. Um, there, around the world, places that are visible symbols of belonging to one another. And we all know what it's like in families, sometimes just having to grit your teeth and love one another. And it isn't always at all easy, as we know in the Anglican Communion. I admit I'm a little biased. I think Anglican Christianity is probably about the best expression of Christianity. <laughs> I would love for you all, do, for you all to perhaps articulate what it is about Anglican Christianity, the way that Anglicanism really follows the way of Christ. Because a lot of people can't or won't run into you on the street, get a chance to take a selfie and ask a question. And I think that perhaps what many would like to know is how does that unification get expressed so well in the Anglican identity? Well, I mean, let me take a stab at it. At our best, um, we are a way, we have a way of following Jesus that demands our all mm. and yet doesn't really demand that we all agree all the time. Mm. At our best, I mean, the Anglican version of Catholic, the uniqueness of it, it's Elizabethan. It is, mm. has its origins in the settlement and a settlement between two Catholic and Protestant competing um, savage, they compete. Savage, yeah. I mean, really. And, and so, our, deep in our bones, somewhere deep in our bones, there's a recognition, I think, that Jesus is Lord, we aren't. And therefore, if Jesus is Lord, there's, the old slaves used to have a spiritual said, there's plenty of good room in my Father's kingdom. <laughs> And, and that, at our very best, has made, created space for possibilities mm. that, that um, I mean, one of my heroes, Espesto Kimonieri. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. He had and, a huge impact on my coming to faith. Yes. I remember really? hearing, him in, hearing him in, came, speaking in Cambridge in 1974, in October, a few days before I became a Christian. Yep. He absolutely. Yeah. Just an incredible human being. I mean, he impacted me. As a young man, I mean, just, just I didn't know that. Well, I was a young man too then. <laughs> yes, you were, Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to think that an evangelist, a revivalist, I mean, he was a great, I mean, he was a revivalist that Billy Graham spoke oh, to. He was. I mean, he was incredible. Yeah. And this tradition embraced a Festo Kivaniere and a Desmond Tutu. Yeah. You, you see, and you see what you have there is the bringing together of the evangelist and the social gospel, not two different gospels, but one. But to have space for that. Yeah, that is. Is a remarkable gift. Um, it is a remarkable gift. So at our best, we've, you know, I can think, and that's a sign, I think, the Anglican Center reflects that tradition, the capacity to be in relationship with others of different traditions, um, ecumenically and even beyond that, that's a, that is an Anglican, that's a charism we have had at our best. Um, and I think it's a way of following Jesus that's open and spacious and yet clear and faithful all at the same time. I think, I, I entirely agree with that. I think, I think you put your finger, I think the fact that we are 
uh, in the old saying, at the same time, reformed and Catholic, um, is, is absolutely crucial. And at our best, what, is that, what that has done is created space for diversity and for flexibility and for adaption. So that the expression of Christianity around the world uh, within the Anglican tradition has similarities, but permits really radical difference as well. Um, and that's one thing. I think secondly, my own experience having visited with Caroline over uh, all our provinces uh, over the last, well, in the first 20 months I was in post. Um, that experience, if you ask me what was one word that came out of what Anglicans do at their best, it is reconciliation, at their best. We're very good at the opposite too, but hey. But at our best, I just found in virtually every province a charism of bringing people together. And it could be over poverty, it could be over war. Um, with the utmost courage and great determination. Um, so, for instance, the church in Pakistan, enormously courageous, has suffered horrendous losses over the last few years to bombs and, uh, and, and uh, great savagery from the Taliban. And yet, they are one of the leading groups in interfaith dialogue. So they haven't turned away. They have embraced those of goodwill and are willing to work with them and listen with them and, and, and talk to them and learn. Now that's, that's an extraordinary gift when, when you've been attacked. Not by those people, but by those, by others in that country. And so the reconciliation, the the need to find ways of growing. The third thing, I love the fact that we don't have, do I mean this? I think I do. <laughs> I love the fact most of the time that we don't have a central authority. There are occasionally moments where <laughs> <laughs> it would be quite good, but. <laughs> the song says, wouldn't it be love? <laughs> <laughs> Um, exactly. Um, but it actually, it is a phenomenal thing that we have to come to our agreements, not through someone making up their mind and saying, this is how it is, and if you don't like it, you can lump it, but just by struggling our way through. And that can take a very long time, and it can be enormously painful. But it's the process of reception that I think is, is part of that gift that comes. Of course, at our worst, if you go to England, I mean, the David Porter, Chief of Staff at Lambeth, was quoting earlier the old saying that, um, in, uh, that, that I've heard from many sources, that in England, bishops tend to behave like medieval barons, mainly because that is what they were. And, um, and, you know, at our worst, we're dominating, we're imperialistic, we're <coughs> cruel, we're exclusive. Uh, we think we know best, the old saying, the vicar goes to see his bishop and the bishop says, how are you doing in your new parish? And he says, oh, it's going well, it's going well. And, and um, the bishop says, how are you doing with the other churches in the area? Oh, he says, it's going very, very well. Bishop's going very, very well. They worship God in their way, and we worship him in his. Um, <laughs> I mean, that, that's Anglicanism at its worst. But at its best, I agree, it's the, it's the Reformed and Catholic. Well, you was talking, I was but you triggered something. And I, hadn't, I, I can keep this. talking. It's, it, it, well, no, no, time, you only have seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We're in America, I'm working on American minutes. And I mean, you have all the time in the world. <laughs> but no, I was, as, as, as you were talking, something, I had forgotten about this, um, but in 1963, one of the, a, a famous document now of American history with the Gettysburg Address and yeah. Declaration of Independence and all of that is, 
uh, Dr. King's letter from a Birmingham jail. Hmm. And you know, now it's a classic and all of that. But um, at the time that it was written, it was written in response to several clergy, um, one of whom was the Episcopal Bishop of Alabama, who were urging Dr. King to go slow. Don't, don't go too fast. We're not disagreeing with the end you see, but the, the timing of it need, needs to go slow. And, and um, he wrote that from the jail in response to that. I mean, that, that was the genesis or the origin of it. Now, the Birmingham campaign was a really, a, a violent one. It was particularly violent. It was a tough one. Um, but but one, of the, one of the people who encouraged him to go slow was the Episcopal Bishop. Well, for years, um, these were good people. They, they just weren't sure about the way forward and the timing of it. These are good people. These weren't bad. These were good people. Uh, but they were each, I'm told, haunted to the day of their death by the fact that they wrote Dr. King and precipitated him writing this letter. And, and I remember reading one was a rabbi whose who, who's children said that he just felt I was at the wrong side, I was on the wrong side hmm. in a moment. You know, just the torture of his soul on that, because these were good people. One of them was the Episcopal Bishop of Alabama. This is a story that I didn't know, but this is Anglicanism at its best. Um, I was with um, former mayor, Ambassador Andrew Young, a couple of years ago. And we were talking in a room, of this room of, of some bishops, and we were just sitting talking. And somehow the question of the Birmingham campaign came up. And he said to you Episcopalians, you have no idea how grateful we are to you. I know that your bishop was criticized for being one of the people who was urging Dr. King to go slower, but I was there. And that bishop opened the offices of the Episcopal Church where the first dialogue between black and white leaders in the city of Birmingham, hmm. Alabama, happened during that time. Reconciliation. Reconciliation, bridge building. Mm. That's Anglicanism. That is a, at its best. best. That is a, it's yeah. not only that. I mean, the Mennonites have a legendary oh, history yeah. in reconciliation, but that is very much part of that. Oh, okay. And that's Anglicanism too. Apparently, what do I talk out of this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this? Private moment here. <laughs> Did you have a little time? <laughs> so reconciliation being one of our real chief gifts as Anglican Christians. Um, I want to pivot just real quickly. Bishop Welby, you referenced the moment when you became Christian. Mm -hmm. And I think in our culture here in America, certainly in Europe, we are at a point where telling the story of Christianity, although good, is perhaps not as powerful in many ways as telling why we ourselves are Christian. Mm. And that witness, I think, is something that Episcopalians here in this country could do a lot more of. Ditto. I would love for you, if you would, to share perhaps your journey and what brought you to that point that you chose this way. Briefly. Briefly. <laughs> Um, I mean, we, I grew up in a family that was parents divorced, alcohol and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so church going was not a regular part of life. In fact, we were what the vicar described as submarine Christians because we surfaced once a year. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's a good phrase. Eh? Like That's it. good. <laughs> and uh, in the end, we didn't even surface then. And um, I was mainly, li I was living more with my father than my mother. And um, cut a very long story short, at the end of uh, school, I went and worked in Kenya for seven months, working in a bush school, a Harambe school it was called, about 70 miles north of Nairobi. And the head teacher there clearly had a relationship with God that having had 10 years of boarding school and morning and evening chapel, and particularly at my secondary school, what you did in chapel was finish <coughs> off your homework. 
behind the hymn book. And having had that, the idea of that this head teacher had a relationship with God in Jesus Christ was completely new to me. It had a huge impact on me. He said in reading the Bible, there were only two books in the house, tiny little house, no electricity or rainwater or anything that I was living in. Uh, the person I shared it with was a practicing Christian. He prayed every morning. I found this very interesting and unusual. And uh, there were two books. One was Baggett's, Walter Baggett's uh, um, description of the British Constitution. And the other was the Bible. So I read the British Constitution book twice. <laughs> And in the end, ran out of anything to read, so I read the Bible. And started at the beginning, did struggle a bit in Leviticus and places like that, but you can skip. And I found it, you know, it, it had an impact. I came back, went to university, to Cambridge, and again, cutting a very long story short, at the beginning of my second year, a friend, late one evening, and it's different when people grow into these things. People are cradle Christians. Some people, it just emerges quietly in their life. They couldn't pick a moment. For me, I know the moment that he explained what Jesus did on the cross. And he'd been taught to know in the nicest and gentlest and most unmanipulative, gracious way, how to draw the net. Because we often don't draw the net. As Anglicans, we're very good at getting the fish in the net through fantastic social engagement and stuff and brilliant preaching, whatever, wonderful liturgy. And then we sit in the boat and we look over and say, gosh, there's a lot of fish in that net. <laughs> look at all those fish swimming around. <laughs> but the whole point that Jesus says to his disciples is throw the net over the other side and then the job is to get the net back in the boat. And... Mm. He said at the end, he didn't do anything, he just, we talked through, he explained the cross to me in ways that I understood. So it was simple, he didn't use religious jargon. And at the end of that, he said, so what would you like to do? I think he expected me to say, I'll think about that. And I said, well, I need to pray, and let's pray. And he looked a bit surprised, and, we, and I prayed a very simple prayer of opening my life to Jesus Christ. I had no idea, I think I said... Uh, I don't even know if you really exist, but if you do, then I want whatever I've seen around me. I want you to be in charge of my life. And that's how it all started. And I mean, the journey from then is incredibly, you know, it was ups and downs and um, hugely influenced by um, meeting Caroline and getting married and hugely influenced by one of our, uh, by family tragedy, and hugely influenced by friends and the strength of the church, and 11 years in the oil industry, and then getting called to ordination, kicking and screaming. And um, here we are. And somehow, despite my failures and weaknesses, when I turn back, to Jesus Christ, there he is, full of love and grace and forgiveness and equipping. And that's a very short form of the journey. <laughs> Amen. So I was touched earlier when you were speaking with some of the diocesan clergy about the relationship between the two of you. You are heads of the Anglican Church here in America and the Global Communion, and yet you are different kinds of people. No, really? <laughs> I hadn't... I've been stopped on the street. They say, are you Justin Welby? And I say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it happens all the time. <laughs> Keep going. If you've ever watched the Prime Minister in the House of Commons, the thing is, when heckled, you just, just keep, keep going. going. <laughs> just keep talking. Okay. I have children, I can do that. So, so being that you are different, I was moved by you talking about how those differences have really enriched your relationship. And yeah. I'd love if, if you would speak about getting to know one another better and how those differences really have colored your own ministry, both here and abroad. 
Do you remember, Michael, that evening after the wedding and we were at St Albans Cathedral yeah. and the BBC interview where they tried to put a... Yes, I remember. Yeah. And they said, yeah. but, you know, Archbishop Welby, you and Bishop Curry don't agree over same-sex marriage. And they were trying to put a difference between them, which there is. And we both said, I can't remember which of us spoke first, but it's probably me because I tend to be rude that way. And, and I, I said, yes, we disagree. I disagree with Bishop Michael. He probably disagrees with me. But in Jesus, we are brothers. We're brothers in Christ. Yep. And the answer to the relationship, which I have to say, I value enormously uh, and treasure, is, uh, is Jesus. Yes. And there isn't another good answer, I don't think. There isn't. <laughs> I, I remember with the, uh, the, the I, I guess it was the BBC, wasn't it? And it I, I guess it was, it was the yeah. B. I remember saying, this is my brother. Yeah. This is my brother, period. We agree, we disagree, but this is my brother. And a, a friend of mine says that um, in baptism, Jesus has made us family. And, and that's who we are. And um, that's the power of this gospel and in this way of following Jesus, that um, this is who we are. And, and, you know, there used to be an old hymn. I don't, we don't sing it as much. I don't, think, I don't think it's in the hymn. It used to be, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts and Christian love. Some of y'all remember that hymn from way back when. For some reason, they took it out of the, I don't think it's in the 1982. But, but you know, there's something about the ties that bind are deeper than anything that can divide. And that's They're why deep. the Anglican Center in Rome works. Yes. Because it's actually saying, sorry, we may disagree, we may not be allowed to share communion, we may have all kinds of problems, we may, disagree, we may have burnt each other at the stake. Uh, <laughs> one of my predecessors actually uh, burnt another of my predecessors at the stake. It's not something I commend. And um, <laughs> just because, you know, you have to be careful what the press say about this. And, but, we, the ACR says, sorry, we're family. And that matters. When I, soon after I was um, elected and then installed as uh, presiding bishop, I, I had uh, actually the morning of my installation, I was running and fell and hit my head. Well, I didn't know that I had actually done anything to it, and it turned out I had a subdural hematoma, but it takes about four or five weeks before that pops up. It's a good thing it didn't pop up that morning because I was preaching the sermon, and you think it was 13 minutes was long? It could have been forever and ever. <laughs> We're hoping not in. <laughs> and so I was getting ready to go into surgery and was sort of you know, in that loopy half, I mean, not because of the medication, but because of the you know, blood down the brain and all that stuff. And I remember um, one of my canons was with me, and I remember saying, well, you have to call the archbishop. And I, was, I remember being loopy, and I said, I have no idea what time it is. And I don't even remember what time it was. But anyway, he got hold of you at some point um, and got hold of And I don't remember the conversation, except I remember you prayed for me. I don't even remember what you said, because I, I was that far out of it. That's the tie that binds. Hmm. That is deeper than anything else. And that's Jesus. And, and that's, man, not to cheapen it, but that's the real super glue. <laughs> <laughs> the real super glue. We well, referenced the Anglican Center in Rome once again. It's a response to this call of Christ to be the light in the dark places. I hope that this is a gift to those who will watch it, an invitation to perhaps do something new, change the way they live, perhaps even begin to follow Christ. If there is something that you could lift up that the center does as an example of a small thing done with big love, I'd love for you to tell that story. And more broadly, 
What would you like to empower those who have seen you, whether physically or perhaps later on, to perhaps do in a small way that could actually change them for good? Ooh. I'd love you to go. <laughs> <laughs> I think of one thing um, that the center does do, I think, uh, in a variety of ways, whether it's in courses or that kind of stuff. It does bring people together from different backgrounds and experiences mm. to share a common experience, whether that is in a course or a tour, you know, not tour, but pilgrimage or something. Or It, it does do that. And there's something powerful about bringing people from diverse backgrounds, experiences, to share a common experience of God in Christ. Um, we took, I went on a pilgrimage about a year ago, two years ago, I can't remember now, um, and, uh, with Episcopal Relief and Development, and we took a group of Episcopalians, uh, different ethnic groups, different parts of the country, different backgrounds, and it was a pilgrimage of racial reconciliation to Ghana. And we, and the Anglican Church there welcomed oh, us. Doing that. And I've got to tell you, there was something powerful about, for us as Americans, some of us African American, some of us European American, to go on a common journey to a place of deep pain. Yeah. And yet to go together as followers of Jesus and to stare at a slave, to stand in a slave castle mm. where there was an Anglican church mm. above the caverns where people were dying and suffering. My church. Mm. And yet, through that pain, to sense something bigger than all of it, that this God is real. And the old slaves used to sing an old song that said, over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. Hmm. And for us to have shared that together, black and white, sons and daughters of slaves, and sons and daughters of slave owners, is to go deeper. That's just not academic study. That's to go deep in the soul as children of God. The Anglican Center does that. And that's, that's a glory hallelujah. Mm -hmm. I think I, that, that's exactly right. There's a seminary that went there a few years back, St. Melitus for the first time. Um, it's sort of more at the evangelical end, so it wasn't their typical place to go. But it had such an impact on those who went that they, they now go every year. Not an impact of just of knowledge. They had a very good course. It was a high quality course, it, but an impact in understanding more deeply the greatness of the salvation that Jesus has brought to the world, that has brought this glorious people who were no people and are now the people of God and who declare the wonderful works of him who brought the man of darkness into his marvelous light. And I think the second, your second question, one thing, I mean, there's an almost infinite amount of things that one can say. I think if I say one thing that will make a huge difference in our church, it is for people to n talk together and be able to explain to each other why they are our followers of Jesus Christ. Why are you a follower of Jesus Christ? You know, in England, I, I'll often say to groups, you know, you, you, go, you go to work tomorrow, you go, you meet some friends, whatever age you are, whatever group you are, and someone says, what did you do over the weekend? Oh, I went to church. You did what? <laughs> why did you do that? Well, can you answer that in, a, in less than a minute without using religious jargon? 
in a way that people, that makes some sense. Um, because when you start telling that story simply and easily, it, it's not that you buttonhole people everywhere. It means you follow the instruction of the New Testament, always to be ready to give an explanation for the hope that's within you when you're asked. <laughs> yeah. Not when you're not. But secondly, that when you hear the story, the love of Christ goes more deeply into your heart and you start behaving differently. Because you realize that God has done wonderful things in your life. And that's such a gift. And so it changes your actions to the poor, changes your actions to people you don't like, it changes all sorts of actions. Well, our time is almost up. Is there <laughs> anything that you would like to share before we end? I, I, I just want to think, we've talked a lot about reconciliation, we've talked about the anger in the center. We need places like that. We need that place. St. George's in Jerusalem would be another one. Places all around the world, particularly in Europe and the US, which model what it is to disagree profoundly and still to love one another. Mm -hmm. I'm not making a party political comment here. But across Europe, we are increasingly unable to disagree without hatred. Are we going to make a difference to that as Christians? Because if we don't, we fail this generation most terribly. I would amen that. I agree. <laughs> you know, and who is it? Dr. King once said, we will either learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish together as fools. Choices <laughs> are that one. chaos or community. I don't want to be a fool. <laughs> <laughs> and I want us to be community. And for us to be committed to that and to work for that, that's following the Jesus of, of whom Paul said God was in Christ reconciling, reconciling the, world the world to himself. Mm. It's given us now that ministry of reconciliation. I think we can all say amen to that. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the incarnation, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus, where we see how deep your love for us is and where your reconciliation on our behalf is worked out. Bless these, your servants, on behalf of your love and reconciliation in the world. Bless the center in Rome as a sign and instrument of that unity and service on your behalf. Bless the ministry of this parish where we have met today. Protect everyone in our communion for whom this service exposes them to danger or hardship. Teach all of us as disciples of your Son that this is the acceptable time to hear your call anew. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Peace be to God.